Did you feel like people compared you to white players? Every time. Yep. And that's like a pandemic in uh-huh. the league, right? Mm-hmm. Sneaky athletic. Sneaky athletic. <laughs> it means you're a white guy. It. Can shoot. That's <laughs> exactly right. But that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, you, you get comp to that. I mean, that's cool. You know what I mean? Like, there's been a lot of good ones. But at the same time, you know, you just go out there and just try to hoop. That's yeah. all I try to do. What's up, everybody? And welcome to another boardroom out of office. And once again, we're recording it in the office. And today I have with me not only a very old friend, but a very, very, very successful entrepreneur and a 17-year vet in the NBA. Let me try to get this all off the top of the head. Two-time champ, rookie of the year, six-man of the year, shot a big-time three with one shoe on, right? Mr. Mike Miller. Fooled him for a long time. Really. Fooled him for a long time. <laughs> Welcome to the show, bro. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Also, what I should have said was the heart and soul of Mitchell, South Dakota. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to oh, quiz you. Uh, What's the population of Mitchell? 13,000. 16,000. Dang, we're growing, huh? It's grown since you left. Wow, wild. Been a little, a lot of little Mike Millers since you left. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's good. Did you, was it ball from day one as a kid? Yes. It, I mean, where I grew up. My dad played, my uncles played, my two older brothers played. Like, you walk outside, it's the wintertime, it's minus 30 wind chill. The only place you had your comfort was in the gym, and my entire family hooped. So it's like, that was the next thing. And we had a legendary high school coach who won tons of state championships, boys and girls. So, like, that was it. You know, I mean, 16,000 people, it was 13 when I was there, I just know. Um, but that's all you had, right? Like you had, you had a hoop and when your family does it, you want to be a part of that. And it just was, that was my life really. Yep. So when I, when you hear me read back 17 years in the league, two time champion, six man of the year, is it still weird for you? It's wild. You know, cause uh, you know, you grew up, you watch, you know, for me, I caught the tail end of Larry and then MJ and like, you're watching on Saturdays, right? Yeah. Like that's the games you're watching. NBC and, on yeah. Saturday. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, that's what you always wanted to do obviously, but that's not that's not the the path for a lot of people coming from South Dakota at the time. You know, it was, it was pre way pre social media and building brands and like it was hard to get teams to recruit you. You had to do something different for them to fly over all these states and do what they did. You know, you had to really set up tone. And so there was no shoe circuits. There was just certain tournaments. You had to go out there and do your thing. And you know, I never thought I'd be there. So to say that those accolades and to even play 17 years or to make it was was wild. So I'm, I'm blessed for sure. So I always I always notice that like it's 50 50 when you ask an NBA player who their favorite players were growing up. A lot of times you'll get like I ain't really watch ball like that. I was out all day hooping. A lot of times New York City like street ball legends will tell you I ain't watch the NBA like that. Then KD will hit you with like Vince Carter. Tracy McGrady was on my wall. It was a new player every month. Was there someone that was the North Star for you coming out of that town? Bird, because my my um, my uncles and my dads, that's what they watched. Um, but for me, uh, you know, I caught the tail end, right? My Mine was MJ. Like, that was the guy that was on TV all the time, right? And plus, I mean, it's MJ. What are we talking about? You know what I mean? So, like, that was, that was what you saw all the time. It was a game that was always on. You know, like I said, now you got direct to you get the league pass, you get all that stuff. You can watch whoever you want. That's why you're starting to see people that are living, you know, whatever city, city have a favorite team that's somewhere else. That was never the case, you know, growing up. So, and then, you know, as I got older, obviously I loved what the Timberwolves were doing because um, it was closest to me, but mm-hmm. that was as I got older. Did you feel like people compared you to white players? Every time. Yeah. And that's like a pandemic in uh-huh. the league, right? Mm-hmm. Sneaky athletic. Sneaky athletic, <laughs> can, shoot like can shoot it, can shoot it. That's exactly right. But that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, you, you get comp to that, I mean, that's cool. You know what I mean? Like, there's been a lot of good ones. But at the same time, you know, you just go out there and just try to hoop. That's yeah. all I try to do. But I mean, but I asked someone that works with me, I won't point him out, but I asked him earlier, I was like, do you think Mike was only compared to white players? Like, who would you compare him to? And names like Glenn Rice started coming out, like from that era, you know, Del Curry. But it, more so back then, but I think you actually changed a little bit of the conversation and Jason Williams, White Chocolate, because when you came in the league and you look at Tyler Hero now, right? Like I, I would think in some ways Tyler Hero, without knowing it, was influenced by you, right? In the way he carries himself, the fact that NBA culture and hip hop culture clearly has had such an impact on him. And 20 some odd years ago when you came out, it had that same impact on you. I think it was obvious to people that followed the game. Um, do you think in some ways you were like one of those guys that really embodied the time and changed a little bit of that same perception? Because 
I think before then it was like he's Larry Bird or he's John Sunvold mm. or he's this guy. Remember that guy, <laughs> yeah, John oh, yeah, Sunvold? Oh, yeah. That's a good, that's a good dig right Thank there. You, by man. the way, um, I feel like you changed it a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you really if you're really starting to it, I think I think Jay Will had a big had a big impact on it. You know, Jay Will's flash, who he was, his persona. Like Jay Will is just Jay Will, though. Like we never, honestly, like that was never a thing. Like for, especially for me, as like I walked into it, and, and I just wanted to hoop. Yeah. And now, you know, what I mean, like that—that that was really it. Like I never really cared what I was compared to or what. I, like I enjoyed, I loved hoop. Like I love, and I still do. That's why I'm in the business I am now. Like very few people are able to do, um, you know, be a part of what their passion is and a business at the same time. And so, like hooping has just always been me i didn't really ever look at who compared me to who and and they're never right on comps anyway so it's just it is what it is <laughs> they used to comp me to my favorite player mark jackson but i couldn't know how to take that one as a kid <laughs> i think it was because i couldn't shoot <laughs> i used to use the body a little yeah, bit well, and then well, i developed hey, my yeah. shot later on and sadly no disrespect mark they stopped comparing me to it. <laughs> then i turned into mike miller <laughs> they that's were comparing right, me to right, you that's right. um you ended up going to Florida with Billy Donovan, and I got to know Billy a little bit um, when I was in Oklahoma City. Yep. Kevin was yep. with him for one year. Uh, what was it? You know, I think at that point, Florida was a competitive college program, but they weren't known for being a basketball school. Yeah. Rich, you know, you've known me a little bit now. Like, you know, like my whole thing is I always do the uncomfortable stuff. And growing up in South Dakota where I was at, like the comfortable thing for me to do and what everyone thought I was going to do was Kansas or Kentucky or, you know, I was fortunate enough that, that, at that time to be recruited by all those schools in Duke and North Carolina. But I wanted to do something different, something that hadn't been done before. And I, I, everything I do, I, I do it on feeling and in people and trust. And Coach Donovan was 30 years old, just getting started. Uh, I wanted to do something different. I could have walked into Lawrence and, and, and Lexington, and my path may have been, may or may not have been different, but there's a million people that have done what I that I was trying to do at Florida, right? And so what you said was right. Like, Jay Will comes with him from Marshall. They have a little bit of a flair there. Um, but it was mostly a football school. And and I meant that when I signed there was, like, I wanted to go somewhere where, you know, in years after that they'd be saying, why not Florida? And I think we did that. You know, the whole group of us, not just me, like everyone that came there with Coach Donovan and his energy and – just turn that school into something that was special, and that's what—that's really what I wanted to do. You guys definitely did. I mean, I think that era solidified, obviously, that program mm -hmm. as a basketball school as well. You played two years there, right? Yes, sir. And then the two years after you left, they won championships? Uh, I think it was four or five. Four or five yeah, years after? Yeah, there's a little gap in between. So, um, I wasn't insinuating that your, no, your no, departure no, had anything no, to do with no, the championship. No, no, I'm trying to get it right because it, it was Joe and Corey Brewer and Al Horford. And Noah. And, yeah, Joe Kim. Joe. Oh, Joe, yeah. Yeah, and so, like, that was that was it. And that's where I, I'll tell you guys, like, me and, and Udonis Haslam and Teddy Pay and right now, like, we take a lot of pride in that because if we don't set that, like, you know, obviously it's painful to talk about that we lost in the national championship game. But it's like if we don't set that tone at Florida, do those guys come there and does the program take its steps, right? And so, you know, that was that was a big deal for us. And you decided to leave um, at that time. You know, leaving after your sophomore year was pretty normal at that yeah. time. That wasn't crazy. And Kenya Martin was the number one pick in that mm -hmm. draft. Mm -hmm. And then you came out and won Rookie of the Year. Yep. Um, and your career, like, throughout had different eras. Like, it's amazing throughout your 17-year yep. career, you know, you were the guy. Memphis run was incredible. I mean, I used to yep. see you in Memphis. You were the mayor of Memphis. <laughs> and I think you guys really, similar to Florida, define the culture of that program. And you see how good they are now. And it's different. But if the feeling is the same. Like, you guys solidified that. And then, obviously, as your career went further and further, you became more of, like, this was a role you were playing on this team. And then even later in your career was more what you were doing for the team here in some ways, which obviously lends to what you do now. What was that like for you? Because I, I know you to be somebody that likes new challenges yeah. all the time. Did you relish in like, all right, I'm in the locker room now to make sure this this runs right like a business? Whenever, yeah, I mean, I think whenever you go through and you do something long enough, you're going to go through pivoting, changing if you want to stay. And that's why I think I bring a lot of value in what we do now based on I've been a guy who was one or the second or first or second option. I've been the guy who came off the bench. I've been the guy that's waving pom-poms, understand how to make it and get through it. Um, but, you know, like – those are the challenges I wanted to bring on. Like you said, like when I was going through it and, and Miami was an option when I was a free agent, obviously with Bron and D Wade and CB and all those guys was, you know, I can go somewhere else, but let me go find out what's up. Knowing my role was going to change drastically 
but I wanted to see at that point what my, you know, what would I act like on a bigger stage? Because, you know, fortunately for me, I had some individual success, but I hadn't had the team success that I wanted. And, and as you are aware of going through with KD a lot is like, it's different when you get in the playoffs and the conference finals and then the finals, like it's a different deal. Like it's not made for everybody. And so like, that was an unbelievable experience for me. I learned so much as a person, as a player. And, and then as you wind it down, like there's so many chapters and as you wind it down, then you become more of a mentor and a person who shows people how to work and stay and get there. And, and so I've had so many different chapters in this life of, of and, and play different roles, you know what yeah. I mean? And so, but it has been a lot of fun with the challenge for sure. You know, it's funny when people, um, sometimes people question when athletes like seek out a winning environment and they have a little bit more of a patience for the LeBrons and Kevins and Stephs of the world because they feel like those guys, we get it. You've earned the right to want to win. But in general, what you just said is a good point because, you know, I saw it firsthand being in the Bay, um, and that was the peak. But it's a different sport. It's a different sport in the playoffs. It's a different, it's a different business in the playoffs. It takes a different type of person up here in the playoffs. And it's more about, I feel like, aspiring for all of it. It's not necessarily I'm going there to win. It's to have a chance, to be on the stage, to feel the energy in the crowd. It's just different. It's a completely different sport, right? It's there to test yourself. I mean, yeah. if you really, if you if you're really about it, like if you really grew up, like everyone says, like my goal was to win championships, or my goal is to do certain things. Like you got to test yourself, and that's a different test. And I tell people, man, like if you're going to go to win a championship and be part of a championship team, you got to be willing to to think about the word. And I, I say it lightly. We used it in we used it in Miami all the time. Was the sacrifice part because it's going to be different. Like your role is going to be different, and sacrifice is easy, man. Like if you know the outcome. When you don't know the outcome, it's hard, yeah. right? If someone told you you can go down there and you can win two championships and you're going to make less money, you're going to shoot you know, 75% less shots, oh, but you're going to win two championships, oh, sign me up. Yep. But if you don't know the outcome, the sacrifice is a bitch, right? So you know, that, that to me was like really testing yourself. And when you got done with a playoff run or you got done with the NBA Finals run, you were just drained mentally. Yeah. Like, you know, the physical part's always there. It doesn't matter if you play 82 games or play all the way through the playoffs. Your adrenaline and, and all that stuff and the way they take care of your bodies now is just there. Yeah. But mentally you're done. Yeah. Like you, you don't even want to, you don't even want to like see a ball come at you no more because every possession counts. And it's just a different game. Like getting through 82 games, uh, you know, on a team that's, you know, sliding in the playoffs, it's it's easy. Yeah. It's when everyone expects you to make a shot or everyone expects you to make a defensive rotation or everyone expects you. Like, that's the mental part of it yeah. that that you have to test yourself. If you're really a hooper, bro, you got to test yourself. Yeah. And that's that's really what I wanted. It's probably why it felt like when the Warriors won their first championship, I was looking at Kevin, and you can't feel happy enough to match what you went through. It's no celebration that will – will take away that like feeling of I'm depleted, man. I gave it my all. It's like the journey is, is, is everything really. Yeah. I mean, we won the first one in Miami. It was, it was like, everyone was like, how, how awesome, how awesome is that? It's like, it more of a relief. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, bro, like, Oh my God. And you, and for two days, you're kind of in that little stigma. Like, I can't believe it just happened. But at the same time, you're mentally exhausted. You're just so thankful that it did happen. Cause and we're talking like you're talking KD situation. We're talking our situation. They're actually very similar. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, we put a ton of pressure on ourselves in Miami to win a championship. And when you finally do it, it's just it's more of a relief. And KD did the same thing when he goes to Golden State, right? Yep. Like you, but that's what we welcome is that pressure. But when you get done doing it, it's like, you're almost like, oh my God, I can't, you know, do I yeah. celebrate? How do I act? And, especially, and that's, that's how it was. Especially when you know the media is about to write, you were supposed to win. Why yes. did he lose the yes. last one? When you hear, um, you know, the reports after you guys beat San Antonio and Ray Allen hits that shot, it's Ray Allen saved yeah, LeBron's right. <laughs> legacy, right? It's like that yeah. sliding doors. Yeah. Everything in the world would have been different if he didn't hit that shot. And and that's what's scary about sports sometimes mm -hmm. is the narrative can cement things in history okay. that aren't true. Did you see J.J. Redick yesterday going off about the narrative around LeBron even and how it still exists today when he is so clearly the absolute like <laughs> greatest body of work and people are still saying, I don't see him as one of the best scorers ever. It's like he's the best scorer ever. He just became number one all time. It's amazing how it can actually get into the minds of other humans. And it really can have impact, which is why when I heard you were starting the sports agency, I look at my career now, and you've known me for a while. 
I've done a multitude of things in my career. And even in the 10 years I've known you, we, we talked about, you know, your lift sporting, um, your power company, your, your energy drink. And I know that brand, what it means to you, you know, that brand is like what I'm building with boardroom. It's in here. It's part of you here, but you need the experience to do it. It's like, if you just started lift when you retired, for instance, you would have had the MBA experience, but what you went and got was experience at Memphis. You saw pre NIL, you saw post NIL, you coached your son in high school for a year and won a championship, which is beyond impressive. And again, not surprising. Like I see how you move. A lot of entrepreneurs move that way. Like you go in, you do the job, you accomplish it. And then it's like, you got to keep it moving, but it feels like you're where you're supposed to be now because you have all of this experience. And when you've done it all and then you're in the middle of putting it to use and you can pull from Memphis, Florida, South Dakota, Miami, ABCD basketball camp, all these different roles, no player can ever say that you don't know. You don't know how it feels. And trust me, I get, I get that. You don't know. You ain't in the locker room. You, ain't, you don't know. You know. So going into this experience and, and when you first signed Paolo, which obviously was like bang, right out the gate, did you feel like, all right, this is what I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be doing now. This is where I'm supposed to be in this basketball landscape. It is right where I'm supposed to be. And, you know, everything in life comes full circle. But you accept all those things, right? Like experience, differentiation, every business is the same, right? And so when you look at the landscape of the, of the agency business, the, the fact that I played 17 years and had those experiences resonates with the kids. But at the same time, I'm smart enough to understand in, 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 in business as well as surrounding yourself with the right people and making sure you're checking every single box. How can we be like them but them not be like us? That's the biggest focus we always have, right? Like we, we have to be better than them, but understanding they can't be better than us. And on the basketball side of things, doesn't mean they're not great agencies, just we're just different that way. And very few people in life get to do something that they've lived, which is basketball, and now start a company that is passionate because basketball is my life. So now I've been able to play both of these things together and merge them together. And, and obviously getting guys like Paolo and the rest of the guys that we have, Wendell's and both Wendell's and JD, like Linus, all those guys to believe in what we're doing and telling our story. Now we just got to capitalize on it and continue to get better. Like we focus every day on making sure we service these guys and get them better. And a lot of that comes with my experience because I know when a guy goes one for seven or where he's at in his head or he's on a long road trip or he's game 50 in his rookie year, like those are things that I've done. And, and I feel that, you know what I mean? So, and I, at the same time, it even trickles down to the families and the friends and the people because you know it, you've been around it. Like everyone goes through the same thing, yeah. whether it's extreme or unextreme, like it's the same thing. Yeah. And so having that guidance and understanding is, is huge. Yeah. And plus, I feel like because I did it, they trust my message. Yeah. Like this is about to happen, bro, just be ready. And then when it does, like, man, you're right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so like those things are huge. So, you know, being able to build a business around something that I love doing and being involved and taking all that stuff is a dream, bro. It really is. Do you like the um, the temperature of the agency world? Because I'll tell you, I was a traditional agent for a short period of yeah. time, right? Like I, in 2013, started becoming an MBA agent. In 2016, me and Katie went and we started a media business. It was no longer mm -hmm. about repping players. Mm -hmm. One thing that always amazed me was you're you're not going to be able to ever distinguish a, the best agent or the worst agent and uh the best agent for you may not be the best agent for kd but i i always felt like the agency business was so like hateful like cutthroat <laughs> i went to this first time i ever went to the all-star game or the combine or something there was an agent like gathering like a social guy i was like oh this shit's about to be popping i thought we was like going to a party or something and i was going to meet everybody and people were in every corner of the room like yo the CAs over there there's Wasserman there's Excel and I was like people don't talk to each other and it was like nah and then I came down the elevator with a certain agent I won't name him but very well-known agent says to me um this is my 20th year being at the combine and he was like talked I, I said no I said to him man stressful <laughs> right it was like my second year he's like tried doing this for 20 years yeah I'll tell you what stressful is I'm like my man if I'm doing this in 20 years, <laughs> I'm going to be really stressed out. But it was that way. It was like all he wanted to do was let it, me know I ain't no shit. Like, nah, you haven't been doing this. Do you? You're not like that to me. Have you just tried to fly higher than that? I mean, I'll be honest. Like, it's it's going to happen. We've been in bit. You've been in business. Like, experience. You talk about experience in business. It's no different. Like, everybody else is trying to put food on their table and do the things and, and establish themselves in certain ways. And you said it just in that question is – 
some agencies are not made for other people. Some some kid is not you know might not made for Lyft. It might be for one of the other agencies. And I never negatively recruit on it. I know there's people who are probably hating on us. Like at the end of the day, we welcome. That means we're doing something right. But at the same time, I know who I am, and I know the people around me who they are, and I know what we're about. I know what our culture is in our company. Like they can say what they want. At the end of the day, I know it's not true. Yeah. Right. So, like to me, I never negatively recruit. There's a lot of great agencies out there. Like you saw when you're going through it. There's enough for everybody, and everyone's not for somebody. Like, if you're about hoop and really want to be better and be the best basketball player ever, Lyft's a great spot for you. Yep. Right? Like, we'll continue to build you and continue to do – but it's, it might not be for somebody else. And so, I'm not – you know, I just think we're different. Yep. You know what I mean? And, and, and I'm going to stay that way. And I, I don't – like, to me, I, if someone chooses somebody else, I still with the kid, like, hey, man, good luck, bro. Like, hey, for real, that's awesome for you. If there's anything I can help you with, I'm out there. Yep. That's the right way to do it. And I think – it always works that way. Like, uh, unfortunately, very few of these relationships are, you know, in perpetuity. So, you know, the ones that feel burnt aren't seeing the big picture. Um, how did you sign Paolo then? You know, that's a that's a that's a strong first athlete out the box. I think his just him as a, as a as a as a person, uh, and it speaks for him. Like, he just wanted to be better as a basketball player, right? Like, you know, there again, the experience side of things. This happened your entire life, right? Like you, you go get a credit card, you can't get a credit card because you don't have credit. The same thing happens whenever you start a new company, right? The thing with me and our situation and our agency is like, yeah, the, the Lyft brand is new. The people that work behind it aren't new. And you just got to sell that story and tell that, and tell that story. And, and Paolo's biggest thing was just how can I be the best basketball player? Right and, and 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 NBA basketball player for guys wanting to be the first pick or be rookie of the year or be 15 time All Star. It's the small things, and you know that it's not the big things. Like everybody, I mean, he's going top three because he's he has the big things figured out. And so it was about, hey, how do I get better training? And I do the pre-draft training. How do I get better this? What does it look like for this? Like he just cared about basketball, and that's rare. Yeah. I'll be honest. Like that's you know because everyone in this day and age talks about marketing and social media because NIL and all that stuff. So. He was just a hooper, and he wanted to get better, and, and, he, and he trusted us, and he wanted to go down this journey with us and path, and we're thankful for it because he's really changed our life on the lift side of things for sure. That's cool. I mean, that has a lot to do, like you said, with who the, who the athlete is because it does feel weird sometimes when you're sitting with an athlete and you understand that what got him or her there was the sport, the work ethic, the support system. And in order to fulfill their goals, they've got so much in front of them but you spend the meeting talking about like managing your social media channels and some athletes want that first. Uh, and some are listening to it and thinking this doesn't really mean shit to me right now because I'm all about who, and it, it's probably refreshing. And then you'll be able to filter out the ones that are right for you. And then critique Paolo's game for me. Like, how would you explain it to someone? Someone's coming here. They said, man, I've been watching basketball forever. I haven't watched in five years. What's this Paolo guy game like? <laughs> tip of the iceberg I'm gonna be honest I think he has a chance to be one of the best and I think uh, he controls that um, he's just beginning to understand how freaking good he is and uh, the one thing I will say about him and why I bet on him all day long is because he absolutely loves it and he dives into it like every time I talk to him it's about hoop how do I get better what do we need to do to get better I just want to win like he's saying all the right things but he's also doing it, yeah. right? And so for a 20-year-old kid who's went number one and been through that, like, I would bet everything that I think he's going to be one of those dudes that we talk about for the longest time. And I think KD said that actually after they played, like, he's going to be that dude. Yeah. And I truly believe it as well just because I know who he is as a kid. I know how hard he works. Um, and he's, he's, you know, even – I'll give you a great start. Like, even summer league, he's playing well in summer league, right? And I go to him and say, hey, dog, you're hooping, good job, but whatever it is. And he's like, I just got to be better. Like, come on, man, like, you're three weeks away from being drafted number one. You know what I mean? Like, he was – but that's who he is. And so, to say who he is as a player, like, I think he's this new era, right? He's 6'10", 6'11", 270, moves like a guard, plays like a guard, unselfish player, unselfish passer, you know, basically a point forward. And and when you see that and you see the way he moves and the way he does it, like, I think he'll end up being a high 30s, low 40s, three-point shooter. When he does that stuff, come on, man. Like, what are we talking about? Yeah. no, I, and, and it's also, like, the intangible that if you watch basketball long enough, it's the way he carries himself. It's the way his body's built. It's the way he knows how to use his body. It's all of it. It's all of it. Do you envision having this – big conglomerate roster or do you feel like you guys are built to be a bit more boutique and hands-on with a certain group of players 
I mean, I feel like I feel like we're boutique until we're not boutique, right? Everyone talks about it. Yeah. I, I think as long as we continue to build the infrastructure out that it feels boutique to the client, then I think we've done our job. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, the the big the biggest thing for us is like picking the right guys now, and 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 we're fortunate enough we have awesome clients now, um, but it's allowed us to kind of sit back, you know put our brakes on, take a deep breath and say, Hey, listen, how do we want to, how do we want to continue to build this thing out? What clients do we want? Um, you know, and not, not that we can get every client that we want. I'm not an idiot, right? Like it's not, it doesn't work that way. If it did, it'd be unbelievable, but it's like, you know, and does he fit who we are? Um, you know, is he one of those guys that love, put hoop first? Like you said it earlier too. And, and it's the same thing. Like some guys want the social media, some we've built all that in, but is it the first box that you want to check? If hooping at the first box you want to check, like it's not might not be for us. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, and that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Like it's not. I've seen a lot of guys that check that box first and are elite basketball players. Like you know what I mean? Like it's not. Yeah. It's like so. Our thing is to answer your question. I guess is, um, you know, right now it's just about getting the talent we you know the best talent we can, but service them the best we can. Like I took a lot of the stuff that I've learned even through playing and what I liked and disliked about my agencies going up and I had the best agents in the world had Arn tell him. I mean he's freaking elite. Oh gee yeah. How do we make that better? And it's crazy even say that, but that's how you do in business, right? Like how do I take this, what I learned and saw and make it better? A hundred percent. We do that with our parents. hundred percent. Um before this you coached one year in high school and won a state championship. But there was a reason. You coached both your sons, one of them who was Mr. Basketball State of Tennessee, which has got to be, like, as good as anything in your life. Um, what was that experience like? I can't even watch my eighth-grade daughter's <laughs> basketball game. I lose it. Um, it was interesting. Um, when, it, when it came to be, you know, uh, my family sacrificed so much. When you play 17 years in the league and you've been in this business enough to know the sacrifice that goes behind it where the family's involved, um, it was like, you know, when COVID hit and I was coaching at University of Memphis, um, the coach at Houston High School where my kids were at decided because of COVID he was going to leave. And I just took, everyone took, kind of took a step back, right? Like everyone just kind of reassessed everything in life. And my biggest thing was like, damn, my son's about to be a senior in high school. My son's a senior in high school and I've been gone. And so what better way to do it? Um, then coach these dudes. So I'm with them every day. And I've already been training them and doing that stuff, but it's different when you're there and practice and pushing them and training. And I looked at them, and when they asked me if I'd do it, and I said, hey, guys, it's going to be different now. There's going to be times, you know what I mean, like I'm going to have to do stuff differently, and I come home and mom's going to be bitching at me. And I said, at the end of the day, if, if everyone's understanding this, it was the greatest experience I ever had in my life. It really was. And when we won state championship and he was Mr. Basketball, my youngest son got to be a part of it, like – those are things you can't ever, especially as you get older, like you can't, you can't, there's not a price tag you can put on that. And so I was the more thankful than anything that I got the chance to do that. It. I got chills for you. Yeah, I can't even wild. imagine, yeah. right? That's wild. That's amazing. And then before that, you know, another stop, um, Memphis. And when, again, like a lot of the decisions you've made, um, I was like, I see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I see it and I knew what you guys were going to do and you know, if if Memphis was just a brand, you and Penny like flipped the brand overnight, which was pretty incredible. And then, you know, you got a reputation in a day of being an incredible recruiter, which all is the same like DNA of an agent in some way, right? And then NIL exploded during that time and you got to see it all. What was that experience like looking back on it? Was it too short? Um, do you regret it? And what do you think you took from that and learned on top of all your other experiences because of the business of college athletics that just like came smack at the program at one time? Uh, I will say I I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, It was too short, um, but it also was the bridge to where I'm at now too because everything that I've done in my life, whether it's played 17 years, coached there, coached high school, coached at Memphis, coached in high school, um, got me ready for where I'm at, right? Because you learn stuff, you learn the recruiting stuff. And it just was one of those things where I loved everything that Penny was doing and we were doing great things. It's just when COVID hit, it was a reset for everybody. And I knew I wanted to be in the basketball side of things. I loved the development side of things. 
And essentially I blended all that into the agency, right? Like recruiting, same thing you do at college. Now I like, unlike other, a lot of other agencies, I'm on the development side too. How do I make my players better? I'm on the gym with them. I'm doing those things. So I took basically what I learned in college, in high school, playing 17 years, my knowledge of that, and just bridged it to this. And so was it too short? Yeah, I love coaching. Like I thought that was what I was going to do. But like everything in life, <laughs> you always think you're about to do something until you're not doing it. So, you know, it all kind of bridged me, you know, like like playing NBA 17 seasons was not a destination for me, right? It was a bridge. Going and coaching college basketball was not a destination for me, it was a bridge. And so all those things bridged me to where I'm at. And if I didn't have those things, I wouldn't nearly be as good as what I am at right now. And I got a lot more to do. Like I got to learn a lot more stuff, but that's why I have great people around me. I'm not an idiot, I know who I am. That's a really good point. I'm going to bite the bridge line okay. because I always look at these things as like eras, you know, as like experiences. And, and when somebody's really frustrated about something and they talk to me, I explain to them that this may be what your thirties are, you know, like this is, this is the time in your life where that really frustrated you. This was incredible. And then in your forties, you'll find something else, but it's never going to be perfect. Um, and those like few years at Memphis, it was what it was supposed to be. Right. Like you said, um, is Penny is Penny one of these like because to me I don't know him at all but he's one of those like um, just necessary figures in our in the culture over the last like 30, 40 years like the phone posits like Lil Penny the kind of way in which his career unfolded and the story around that Orlando Magic team and um, even when I used to see him at your playoff games like it was like OG was sitting courtside I mean he was the guy is that like the feeling he gives off as a coach, is he just this, like, superstar? Yeah, that's why he's had so much success. He's, he is. I mean, he's – to be able to – and you and you know this, um, and you've seen the NBA long enough, to transition eras and still be that dude, it's hard to do. Yeah. Most of the time when you retire and you're done, it's like, okay, where did he, where did he end up? Where does he go? You know what I mean? But Penny was just always that guy, little Penny. Phone yeah. posits, his shoe. Can, now part of that's all, you know, his his strength in Nike and understanding the phone posits and bringing the retros and yeah. keeps you relevant. But he's just that dude. And and on top of that, like, he's, he's cool as shit. He one of the nicest dudes ever. So he has so many things going for him, but there's no trick to it. That's why. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, you know, you see successful people. It's not like you're like, oh, man, why, how do you become successful? Yeah. When you hang around enough of them, it's pretty evident yeah, you why. you see the common thread. 100%. Did the guys get to watch tape of him? Oh, yeah. We had to bring it out because everyone, you know, when you're, when you're recruiting him, you're like, yo, I'd, I'd have done better. No, come on, man. Go watch Penny. You know what I mean? Like, no chance. Penny could have been one of the greats. Yes. Yes. Incredible. Yes. Would, did he have a weakness? No. No, right? No. He could Size, shoot it, too. athleticism, point yeah. guard, shoot it. No, he's Real elite. point guard. Yeah, he's elite. Real so, point the guard. only weakness he had was health. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, having a career end for health or, or, you know, getting to year 17 mm -hmm. and having to hang it up, knowing you love hoop so much. And obviously you're still in it, but how tough was lit literally walking away, knowing I'm not playing a professional basketball game ever again. I think, I think the biggest thing is like for me walking away from the game and being the age I was, that's what made it so lucky. Like a lot of people don't know when they're going to retire. I was able to kind of choose when I retire, but the hardest thing is, is knowing that when you leave, that you're never going to be able to replicate what you just experienced. I don't care any business you do. You'll never be able to replicate that locker room. You'll never be able to replicate you know, playing in, uh, in front of, you know, 30,000 people. You'll never be able to replicate playing in the NBA final. You'll never be able to replicate it. And that's, that's, that's sad. It's demoralizing, right? Like, oh, my God, I'm 38, and I'll never be able to replicate what I just feel did. Feel that feeling. Feel that ever again. And so – you, your your whole mission then is a okay cool for the last twenty years I've I've had to sacrifice and do these things I'm gonna go take care of my family do whatever right and you want to do that because that's where you're at but then it's like okay how do I get close right like how do I how do I take all this stuff that I learned um, and help others but also you know give yourself that competitive feeling and so that's where college basketball yeah. came in right that's where high school but now that's where this comes in because it's still competitive and it's yeah. still who. And it allows me this the best thing about this one allows me to be a part of my family still. I, I picked I picked the hours, I picked the stuff and and so it's just a perfect world. I think you're right because you know my I didn't have a career, but my basketball journey ended at the end of high school because I had too big of an ego to like play somewhere that I didn't think I could run around and tell everybody in my neighborhood that I played <laughs> there. So I was like, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> but when I think about it, 
there's like one or two games that I could get nostalgic thinking about at any time of day. You know, I remember the last game I ever played. I remember the conversation I had with my best friend on the team and where my mom was in the in the gym like it was yesterday. And then I found a, a, um, a clip of a game we played in the state championships, lost in the semis on YouTube. I will not send it to you, but if you find, <laughs> if you find it, it holler at me because I was 0 for 9 from the field. Yeah, it was tough. Um, it was tough. And I was a sophomore, and I was just wanted people to recognize me, and they kept putting me down as a senior at the uh, on the thing. And, like, you couldn't change shit back then. So I was like, I was a senior. It was over. Um, what part of your NBA career do you look at? And that's when your eyes, like, you look up and you start fantasizing about the days again. Is it Miami? Is it Memphis? There's it, certain it, games. It, it's, it's Miami just because of the stage. You know, I mean, at, at the end of the day, Memphis was my best overall basketball as far as a basketball player. Um, but you can never, ever in a million years put together and, and how am I trying to word this? Like, you, like I said, replicate again, playing on that stage with that team at that time. Um, with those guys. With those dudes, um, with those expectations. Uh, and then when you watch it now, it's like, oh my God, we did that. You know, it's like, it's everything, everything in life. You don't ever appreciate anything until you're removed from it from a minute, right? Like I, I tell people all the time, when I chose to leave Florida after we lost the national championship to Michigan State, it wasn't even that painful. But then when I got seven, eight years in the league, I'm thinking, damn, I could have won a national championship. Yeah. Then it became painful, yeah. right? Because that. At 19, when I left, I'm like, oh, I'll have a chance to win championships. I was naive. I'll yeah. have a chance to win championships all the time. And then I get seven years in the league, I'm not even sniffing it. Yeah. You're like, no, I might not ever get it again. And I smoked the opportunity yep. as a sophomore. So it's like everything, man. Like, And so now when I look back at those Miami – all the days, but the Miami days, obviously, because we won championships and it was part of that team. Um, it's just – I mean, you're, you're just like, oh, my God, that was, that was unbelievable. Yeah. It, was unbelievable. it really was like – you know, I mean, you guys were called the Heatles, right? Yep. Yeah, Pat Riley. Yeah. Spolstra coming yeah. into his own, and then obviously Bron, yeah. D Wade, Bosch, and and even you at that point, you know, as a role player, you were famous, like yeah. you were a well known role player. I remember that like three days when everyone was signing, it was like, how did Pat Riley just pull off Mike Miller? <laughs> like, what did he get everybody to agree to do? <laughs> like, he probably put his rings back on the table. All the things that people were like, this is going to be the spectacle. You know, now we see these things on a year to year basis. Um, but if Ray Allen doesn't hit that shot. What is it like in Miami the next day? Yeah, I mean uh, that's I mean that's the question, right? right? I mean you end up at the end of the day you end up winning one championship, um, or or Bron doesn't leave and you win three more, right? Could, like oh, yeah, it yeah, always yeah, could change. Yeah, there's everything everything in ha everything in life you never understand the course of action for what happens at one moment, right? Yeah. So, but at that point we do know what happened, and it was <laughs> it was it was epic. The crazy thing I tell people, and that's why all these young kids, man, like I watched Ray Allen practice that shot wildly enough, that back pedal shot, Damn. every single day. Getting the ball in that like no man's land, he would, back he would, pedaling. He would, start, he would start like the dunker area, and he would back pedal out, and he'd shoot that shot at least 50 times a day because it's routine. And, that, and again, that's how I am now. I was, I, when I played, I was a huge routine guy. I got my routine from Reggie Miller. I watched him do it. Um, figured out, you know, like I said, every time you're around successful people, it's not hard to figure out why they're successful, yeah. right? So then I stole it from them, right? There's no reason to reinvent it. Now I put my things in there, like, what do I do? But I saw Ray Allen. Ray Allen was the same way. Huge routine guy. I watched that shot before it happened every day in practice before practice. And that's like, so to answer your question, I think I, I was, you know, kind of went a wall way around it, but you never know what would happen. But we do know, and it, was, it, was a, it ended up being a world championship that's for us. Right. So it was massive. How many times a week are you asked about um, the one shoe? <laughs> that's that's the one that gets the most play for yeah. sure. Uh, I get it a lot, you know, and uh, I wonder when it'll, you know, when that era will end. The people that watched it, but you know, it's it's a it's a special moment for me for real. What I know, LeBron posted something the other day about it, right? The mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Is there? I mean, I, I'm, again, to my last question, I don't want to bore you with having to tell the whole background. Um, <laughs> But is there a tidbit about this story that is fascinating to you always of how that all went down or like why the shoe came off or, you know, did you almost foul on purpose to stop play? What was it? 
I mean, it was just it was just a random. I mean, it happened. Yeah. And then, and when you you know you're in the middle of an NBA Finals game, and to be quite honest with you, we're getting what we're getting boned. At the, we're getting hit pretty good. Like they're getting us. And so, you know, my shoe falls off. I try to untie it. Doesn't come untied. There's nothing else to do. And everyone's like, well, why'd you shoot it? I had no other options. Yeah. You know what I mean? Try, try moving on a sweaty sock. You know what I mean? So it was the only thing I had. <laughs> and, and Bron, and, you know, obviously his, my guy went to go double Bron because I had no shoe on. And, and Bron's, you know, that's the only right thing. Play. I, that's the only thing I know how to do, shoot it. So I just shoot it. So the other day, LeBron um, broke the scoring record. Yes. Did you watch it live? Yes. I did too. I felt, I felt like, it was, um, I felt like it, was, it was special to be watching it live. I'm happy I got to – I went to the net game – I got back, uh, put my kids to bed, and turned it on one of them special times where I was like, oh, he's only eight points away. <laughs> like, this it couldn't be better. Um, what did it feel as a friend and a teammate? I'll be honest. Um, knowing it was going to happen, uh, you, you talk about it all the time. And what I'm most amazed about is that at, at, at 38, he's averaging 30 points a game. Eight, eight and a half rebounds, seven, whatever it is. It's just ridiculous. Like, like appreciate that. You know what I mean? Like, I never thought that'd be a record that ever be broke. I'll be honest. And I played with Bron. Like, that's not a record I thought. I just can't see this record being broke because, you know, everyone asks me all the time just because my relationship with them is like, w when do you think it ends for him? The answer, I don't know anymore. You know, three years ago, I said three years. You know what I mean? Like, can he do this for three more years? I'm like, God, it'd be really, really hard. And now you're sitting here and he's, he's, Having some arguably some of the best basketball he's ever played ever, and if you asked me to bet my life, I could say three years easy. He looks as physically I, fit as ever. And then we'll be here, he'll be forty one. Be like, well, when's he going to be done? Well, three more years, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's he's he right now. He's he really is three years away from being three years away. I don't, I can't see the closure because of how much time and effort and stuff he's put into his body, and where he's at, like. Athletically, he's not where he always was, but he's still athletic as, as can be. And he's oh, still yes. fast, and he's still and he's shooting it better than he ever had. He's averaging thirty IQ eight and off the seven charts, yeah. <laughs> as a thirty-eight year old. I mean, what are we talking about? So who knows where that scoring to? I don't think it's. I think it's something that'll never be broken. Yeah, I just can't see it happening because just to average thirty at thirty-eight point thirty-eight years old is. You know, KD will probably end up in the top five or six. Like if you look at the math, he will. And he's had some games missed to injury. Mm -hmm. Oh, he will. I mean, K KD to me is the most prolific scorer I've ever seen, personally to me. Yeah. Um, easiest, like walk in, just tie your shoes up. I'm gonna give you 35. I'm out. That's that's KD to me. Like he can do it on any, at all three. But, He's the hardest cover. But and but similar to what you said about Ray Allen is the shot that looks easy. He practiced oh. a billion times that morning. Hey, hey uh, I'll, you you show me a successful dude, and I'll show you his work ethic. Like it, dude's, the dude's a grinder, bro. Yeah. Like, and that's what people don't appreciate. Like that's that's the other thing. Like. Again, you can't and you can't appreciate it as a fan, as a person that just watches basketball, of how much sacrifice actually goes into it, how much work goes into it. Now we love it and we're fortunate. Like NBA basketball players are so fortunate. They pay us an exuberant amount of money and we got a great life and we're doing something we love. But there's so much work into it. Yeah. Like like I've seen Katie do it. I've seen him put in the hours. I've seen it. And again, like he has a lot of gifts from God for sure. Size, athleticism, but he's put the work in. Yeah. And so, like, those guys, again, it keeps going back to it. It's about the work, man. It always is. Um, break down D. Wade's game and career for me. Oh, man. Dude, huge, huge balls, man. Like, you strap up for a game, like, that dude's coming, right? I, one of my favorite teams. I, I, I just knew if it was game six or game seven, okay, we're going to be we're gonna be fine. Defensively, offensively, you know, I mean, uh, just – just he's a grinder too. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, our practices were better than all of our games. Like to see those guys, to see everyone go at it in practice. Man, he was he was such a special dude and, and special competitor, and he took on exactly what he, Miami Heat is. Like yeah. that's D Wade, D Wade, Udonis has him. Like you just think of those guys a lot. Of, like those are those are Miami Heat dudes. He was an absolute monster. And Riles, man, oh, I, I'm the biggest Riles oh, fan best. ever. I love he's that dude. He's the best. He's the best. See, I mean, he he, he just I mean he just knows. You know what I mean? Like he knows. Yeah. He's, he's, he's smart enough to understand exactly what he wants in a player, in a, in a system, in a culture, and he creates it, and there's no budging. Yeah, none. And how old do you think he is? I, I mean, we could Wikipedia. Oh, he's probably yeah. 72, yeah. 73, right? And he's still going. So every time I go to Miami, 
I reach out to him and I meet him yep. for coffee. I'm such a fan, and that relationship is important to me. And he understands. I think that's why he always meets me. And we spend a lot of time talking about the present, and then I go deep into, yeah. like, Knicks days. Yeah. I mean, I've asked him the same question about the Knicks, like, for the last 10 years that I've known him. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the heat. But when you talk about current day, what amazes me is someone who's been through everything is talking like he just got the job. <laughs> like he's talking like he just got the job in Miami and he's talking about players he wants to look at on the wire. And this guy is as locked in of a competitor as I've ever been around in my life. Is that true? He's the biggest competitor I've the ever biggest. seen. Um, and I guess to have longevity like that, if the passion wears out and, and, the, and the hunger's not there, like it's never going from him. I don't, I don't, I don't see him ever doing it, ever leaving. I don't see him ever transitioning to anything else. No because way. That's who he is, though. You know, you had enough conversations with him. Like, he was one of those guys that literally put fear in players. Like, you'd see him like, okay, I'm going to straighten up here a little bit. You know yep. what I mean? Like, that's him. Yep. But he demanded that. And, and again, it's, it's who he is. And he's the biggest, one of the biggest competitors I've ever seen in my it's life. Crazy. I've, of all the times we've, we've had coffee or something, I've never talked about anything else with basketball. <laughs> I mean, I'll bring up his family, but it's like it's in his blood. That's right. That's right. Um, all right, before I let you go um, – First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm excited we connected. I'm excited about what you're building. I have great memories of conversations of ours back in the day, especially when like me and Kevin first started working together. Um, you remember a business you brought to me once? Which one? one of the best ever. It's one of my favorite stories between you and I ever because it was almost like you knew and only I knew when I saw that you knew <laughs> and that you had the recipe, but it was three MVPs and me. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So the, the idea was you and three NBA MVPs, right. and, and you guys were going to open up this, yeah. this franchise. And I remember thinking this idea is incredible. And then I went home, and I thought to myself, I wonder if technically it could be three MVPs and me, though. <laughs> <laughs> because I, as much as I love Mike, this feels like it's about the three MVPs. <laughs> It was. <laughs> it worked it out. Worked, it worked yeah, out for everybody. Yeah, um, last question. This is a tough one. It's it's forever, but it feels right because of what LeBron did the other night. And you've watched MJ play, and you've been around LeBron. Can you even compare them? Is it actually a pointless conversation? Because comparing someone's resume or body of work would be like saying that's the best artist of all time because they have the most record sales. So that doesn't count. That's not how you judge. LeBron's body of work is flawless. There's no way to compare MJ's body of work, seriously, yep. except for six for six in the championship. But can you even compare them as players? Or is this a stupid conversation? I mean, I hate it. I'll be honest. And I know why people do it, because they have to, right? But at the end of the day, we can have this argument back and forth, and we can bring 10 people in. And someone could say this, that, and the other, and be like, damn, you're right. And then I come back with something else and be like, damn, you're right. So, like, to me, unless they played against each other in the same era, is, is it different? They're both great. I mean, we're talking about, like, probably the two best. Yeah. So what are we really arguing about? Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's impossible to have a right answer. Because, like I said, you know, six championships is unbelievable, right? What Bron's going to be top five in every major statistical category ever yeah. is unbelievable. Longevity, like – I mean, that's that's part of the, the, the fascination with it to me is the I've been 38 before. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I felt like at 38. Yeah. I wasn't averaging 30. Well, I never averaged 30 a game, not even when I was <laughs> my prime. But you know what I mean? Like that's that's to me like that is amazing. But yeah. the argument to me is, you know, I hate the argument yeah. because I grew up a Jordan guy and I played with Bron and he won me. Ch they're both unbelievable. Yeah. And I never thought I'd see another Jordan. And then obviously there, there's guy, you know, they're not him. I just don't ever think I'll see another LeBron. Never, yeah. I just don't. I, I, I just – so the argument's hard. It's, it's really it's hard. It's really impossible. Yeah, I, I almost feel them. like there's a little bit of, like, trying to compare Drake and Jay-Z. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't matter what the numbers say. Yeah. If you, you know how you felt when Jay-Z came into the world That's and right. what that changed. And That's however right. you want to compare that, That's right. it is what it is. Yeah. Um, all right, man. Well, I'm excited to see what you're going to build this lift agency to. I know you'll be as successful in everything you do as you have been. And it's a pleasure catching up with you, reminiscing, and uh, to great success. Appreciate you, brother. Thanks My for having brother. me. Yep. My man. Thank you guys for listening, subscribing, watching. 
Go to boardroom.tv, support Mike Miller. We'll see you all soon.